Peace, everybody. We're raising money to hold a food and jacket drive for the homeless and hungry of downtown New York at Tompkins Square Park. There's a lot of homeless people in New York right now. They take shelter in the subways because of the heat. It's cold, and we're going to be handing out hot food and jackets at our food drive. To everyone who donates, we're going to be sending out Going Somewhere Better, a photo zine featuring action shots of Gusto, Goog, Stays, Cato, Royce, Lunch, Leech, and more. All photos were shot by Lunch GSB. The zine is only available through our Patreon for the month of January, and the proceeds from the zine will go directly towards food and jacket expenses. The link to that is in the episode description and our website. All who donate via our Patreon get the zine, any monthly products we produce, as well as access to our episode library with interviews from XSM, Less YKK, Host18, Cash4, and Sake. Big thank you, as always, to anyone who listens to the show, anyone who donates to our fundraisers or supports in any way. Without y'all, none of this would be possible, and we appreciate it more than you could imagine. Enjoy the episode. Peace. Yo. All right, we're live. Check. Dude, uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah. It's kind of crazy because just like the homie sent us a picture of uh, you, like you screenshotted the Andy Roy shit. Yeah, yeah. And posted on your page. And then I'm like, oh shit, dude. So then that's when, that's yeah. when I like, reached out because I had, I had no idea. You know, it's like we never know who listens or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So. Like, uh, I think, well, first, thank you for having me. Like, I appreciate it. I respect all that you do and appreciate it. Um, but I think I first. Maybe got turned onto the show through Nick Atkins. Oh, um, sick, dude. Because Nick's like an old friend of mine and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so then I just started watching it. And what's cool is like, you know, even though I'm not a part of graffiti culture, I still like appreciate it and appreciate the stories, the passion and everything that goes into it. So it's like, I don't know. It's just like a generally good podcast. Dude, that's, thank you so, so much. That's bro. like, that's why... And then when you see Andy Roy, like, you just know he's going to have stories. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Yeah. So, you know, I watch that. And I watch a bunch of other ones, too. And then it's funny who the people I know just in life that get shouted out on the show. I'm like, oh, because yeah. I don't really know about their graffiti stuff. Mm. You know, I know about mm. their art stuff or this or that. And so to hear their name get brought up, like, I was like, oh, that's sick. You never tried out writing graffiti, like, all your years, just, you know, being in the downtown scene skating or just being a part of, you know, a lot of graffiti writers get into other forms yeah. of art as well? No, I mean, it's like when I was mad young, like 12 or something, maybe I'd go down the train tracks with some friends in Jersey. And it's weird, like, you didn't do it unless you took it seriously. Yeah. You know, you didn't just, like, fuck around. Like, so... I knew pretty much from the beginning that I wasn't good at it. And, like, I'm not wasting anybody's time. I'm probably not even a good lookout. Like, I'm just not good at anything. <laughs> and so I just stuck to skateboarding. You know, that was, like, my shit. And, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, like, like I have friends who are good graffiti writers and good DJs and that kind of thing. And it's sort of, like, respect thing. You just yeah. kind of, like, say, like, no, that's, that's you. I'm going to do me, you know. You know, it, it's crazy like uh just the era that you came up in it's it's often it's often frequented like it's a frequent topic on our show just uh, all the art and culture that came out of there as well as the difference in the neighborhood particularly like the downtown neighborhood how different it was and obviously just you you being a part of that and it's often talked about how cheap the rent was and how mm -hmm. not cheap it is now and how uh that mm -hmm. cheap rent essentially fueled creativity and fueled a lot of the art and culture that gave back, to, like, in a major way to America and just to the world as a whole. Yeah. Um, and I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that, like, seeing things change to the point where there's just, it costs so much to be down there yeah. that it's it's difficult to, I guess, be creative because you don't have as much time if you're working your ass off to make 3K just for your rent or something like that. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's... But it goes way back, it goes back to like the 50s and 60s and shit. And like all the artists lived down in Tribeca and stuff and they had these giant lofts and in these lofts they could create these monumental things. And then the galleries needed to compete with that. And so the galleries got bigger and kind of imitated these big lofts. Um, and so slowly over time, like shit got more expensive, but it also kind of like made the creativity get smaller because you didn't have these spaces to kind of create and just experiment yeah. pretty much. So now like a lot of artists are just painters because you can pack a stack, some paintings in a corner. It wouldn't like, 
it's not that big of a deal, but you can't make a giant sculpture. Mm. Um, but like, cause I'm from Jersey originally. And so when I came to the city, I was 12. That was like when I first started coming in, going to Brooklyn Banks, and like that kind of thing. And you, you could survive off $5 a day, you know, just being, you get your like $1 gallon of iced tea or whatever. and whatever, like get a cup from Burger King that everyone used, that kind of thing. And uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know like how any of us really kind of made money. DJing helped a lot of people out for a long time. Like everybody DJed for a minute. And that was cool, you make 300 bucks cash and a night and you could just like do whatever with it. But, um, but yeah, everybody just kind of got by and a lot of skate houses, three, four people, like always somebody on the couch, kind of a thing. Random roommates, like, oh, there's just this dude who needs a roommate. But but we managed to have a lot of fun. And, it, what, and yeah, like none of my friends really had jobs. Really? They were like in bands. Or and they, and they lived or, essentially downtown. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it's like kind of hard to remember. It was all kind of a blur. Um, and there's so many different stages to the kind of my version of downtown like but yeah so i don't know it's almost like you almost have to be more specific yeah, yeah. Around do you remember do you price. remember how well, like for example what was one of your rent prices when you lived when you lived down there during that time period i mean it was always around like 500 bucks you know sometimes i was just saying i lived out in bay ridge and it was like 200 bucks but that's because it was somebody's grandma's house and it was five bedrooms and they wanted a thousand dollars rent um i think i remember i was living in brooklyn like prospect heights or some shit and it was like 750 and that was like and then the room came up in the east village for like 900 and i was like shit all right i want to make the jump because you're spending that on subways already yeah, yeah. and when you're going out seven days a week, getting home at 4 a.m. sucks. You know, like, the, you got to wait 45 minutes for the train. You're all drunk and fucked up. And you're like, man, I just want to live, like, in the center of it, you mm-hmm. know. Um, so that, I would say until I moved in with my wife, I paid under $1,000 a month. So that was probably 11 years ago. And I was like, I'm only paying fifteen hundred. Like I was like, mad cheap, you know. I'm like, I'm mm-hmm. not, now she's got me paying a crazy amount. But, um, but like I've never had a credit card in my life. Like, really, you still don't have a credit card? I just got one. <laughs> what? Because I have a business. Yeah. So, but like, I'm like a cash dude, you know. And so like I'd pay my rent. I've never been on a lease. I've always just lived in like other people's spots and paid them cash at the end of the month. And you just figure out how to get that cash together, you know? Wow. Um, so, so we were never like balling, but we made, made do, you know? And we had, like I said, like a lot of fun just kind of mm. getting by. What do you think that does to just the, the, like the process of building a small business in New York, especially if you're in that area, but really just everywhere, everywhere in New York, what do you think that does to that process? Like, for example, you you running galleries, finding a space that is, you know, at least somewhat affordable, so that way you can at least, you know, make the overhead every month. And you have to, like you said in some other interview, it becomes like a business-oriented model. Everything becomes like a business-oriented model. And, I mean, in dealing with things like art and culture, like, it shouldn't necessarily always be a business-oriented model. More so just about, like, creating passion and beauty and, you know, showing talents, and it just kind of fucks everything up. Um, what do you think it does? I mean, for me, I thought COVID was really interesting and fucked up and weird, but I was like, now's the time where kids can fucking actually get in this, and now's the time where kids should be opening art galleries and music venues, doing whatever the fuck they want, because it's the only opportunity they're going to get until the next pandemic, but... Like, for me, I mean, it's a long story to how I got there, but basically I'd been working for a corporate gallery in Chelsea, 
and getting paycheck, health insurance, like doing all right. Then COVID hit, I got fired. And I've always been pretty good with saving money just cause like, that's who I am. And, uh, and so I found this spot on St. Mark's and I was like, damn, like that would be kind of sick to have a gallery on St. Mark's. And I'd already done my own gallery before the corporate gallery. Mm. So I knew what it was like to sit there all day and fucking whatever. And, and it was only because of COVID that I had this opportunity to get this space on St. Mark's. And, uh, and then that gallery, I was like, fuck, I want to make a gallery for the kids that hang out on St. Mark's. Like, I don't give a shit about the art world anymore. I want this to be for the kid I was when I was 17, looking just to be comfortable walking into a gallery. So that, like, changed my whole perspective, just that location. And then a year went by, landlord wanted to double the rent or whatever. So I went down to Henry Street, which is where I am now, and there's a whole gallery scene down there. And... On St. Mark's, the landlord was always breathing down my neck. He like wanted to like profit share, do all this crazy shit. But he, people in the art world don't make money. Like, they front like they make money. Yeah. Some people make money, but like a lot of that shit is bullshit. Like even the big Chelsea galleries, they're all running on debt. And like, you know, they might pretend to fly around to Miami or whatever, but like. <laughs> There's a lot of overhead. You gotta yeah. sell a lot of art to cover that. And art is sort of like a trending thing. You know, you could be the hot artist one year and nobody buys your shit the next, you know? And so galleries need 40 artists to always kind of be able to pay the rent. Um, but yeah, so I kind of sort of took it upon myself to show these kids that this is possible that I'm a fuck up. Like I have no credit. I have like, I'm like so bad business wise. And if I can do it, you can do it. You know, like I don't even know what I'm doing. Like for the most part, it's like I have no plan business or otherwise. It's just like, all right, what's next? You know, how, how did you learn to like, how the fuck did you get into this? Like, how did you learn for example, if if, I, if it was up to me to do it, I would I wouldn't know the first place to go. Like I would probably just walk into a place that has a four lease or four rent sign yeah. and be like, "Yo, like, uh, how much a month?" Or some crazy like it would be the worst possible way I could probably approach it. Like, how did you learn how to do all this? How did you learn how to contact artists? Set up an actual show? Are there any documents? Like, how did you learn this shit? Just fucking wing it. You know, it's like <laughs> it's um. It's like, I don't know, because, all right, so you have to go, like, way, 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 way back, right? So when I'm 14, I meet Larry Clark, right? I don't know what Larry, who Larry Clark is, what he does, whatever. He's talking about this movie. I'm like, eh. You know, a lot of people are a little suspicious of, like, what the fuck's this old man talking about? And he'd be hanging out with, like, Andy Roy and shit. Mm. And Mark Gonzalez and Mickey Reyes and all these dudes. And, you, and Julian Stranger. And you'd go over his house... And you have all these fucked up skaters there drinking. And then all this weird art on his walls. Like Mike Kelly, Christopher Wool, like today's like heavy hitters. He was friends with all those dudes. And so like I'm already like absorbing this shit. Like, wait, photos of stuffed animals can be art? Like, what the fuck? Like, you know, I thought everything had to be like Picasso or whatever. And then obviously like growing up skating, looking at graphics. I don't know. It's like... You're just absorbing it all the time. And then, I mean, all my friends, just a lot of artists come out of skateboarding. And so you have that foundation for a friendship and you have the same references and, you know, you talk shit. And uh, so Ryan McGinley, the photographer, was a skateboarder. And... Uh, we worked at like kind of competing skate shops in New Jersey at the time before we moved into the city. And uh, Ryan's house was sort of like the party house, like his apartment. And it was him and Teddy Luanakis, Dan Colin, and uh, who else? Kid America would live there. Um, it was just like a 
flop house, mm-hmm. which in some respects kind of became like the Iraq headquarters in a weird way. Um, Cause like Kunle would always be there. Fanta, like this is in Jersey. Dash. No, no, no. This is on Seventh Street in okay. New York. Like I walked by the stoop the other day and I got like nostalgic. Like, damn, remember that stoop? Like that was sick. We had so many good times on that stoop. Cause that's what you do. You would just like get drunk and like figure it out. All right, where's the party tonight? Like whose night can we go ruin? You know, like we're we like were kind of unstoppable at that point. You know, we would just like go and ruin parties. It's just. Everybody was fucked up on different shit, and it was always just chaos, but so fun when you're young. And uh, so now to Ryan and Dan and Dash and all these other kids kind of orbiting this 7th Street apartment and just, like, nightlife in general. Like, it seemed like nobody had jobs. Like I said, like, everybody was just an artist or trying to figure out who they wanted to be in New York. And then you just meet other people, and, like... Uh, one of those people was my friend Nate Lohman, who became one of my best friends. And so, you know, you're just getting fucked up talking about life and art and all this shit. Like, that's what we were kind of obsessed with. And we were talking about art so much that we were, at some point, we were like, let's just fucking start a gallery. Like, who the fuck cares? This like, was way back then. No, this, see, that's what I'm saying. It's like a long journey to get. Okay, okay. So this is probably 15 years ago. Okay. And so we got this little storefront window that was in front of somebody's studio. And we called it Home Alone Gallery because the art was in there by itself. And if you had a brick, you could get like a $50,000 painting. Like, you know, it was so crazy. And the artist would do it with us because... Our motto was like, the artist is always right, even if it's wrong. Like, we can't tell the artist what to do. We're in no position to do that. Even though it's our house, they're still the artist. You know, you got to give them that respect. And so, uh, so that kind of worked in a weird way. It was open 24 hours because it was a fucking window. And it was maybe half the size of this room. It was, it was small. But people liked it. And um, and then we did Home Alone 2. That was a more official space where we got the front storefront that somebody else was sharing. And the front was kind of built out like an art gallery. So that's when it kind of like took a step up. Um, and then, because again, we didn't sell art. Because Nate's an artist, our other partner, Hannah Leiden's an artist. They, they, they didn't want to sell art. And, uh, and they also kind of didn't want to be there. They just wanted to like put together shows. So I became the like front of the house dude, just by chance. And uh, so again, we had great relationships with the artists. The galleries liked us because we weren't like trying to bank off them. We weren't trying to get a cut of the sales for the artists because nothing was for sale. So that gave me enough of a res- resume to go work for like a major gallery. Mm. But it was all just like, ride it till the wheels fall off. You know, like, I don't know what I'm doing. You didn't have any, like, major long-term plan? No, I... Like, my current lease is two years, and every time I'm like, after this shit, I'm stopping. Like, why do I continue to do this? Like, I don't make money off this shit. Like, I break even, but I have another job. That's how I make money. I've always had a side hustle to kind of afford me what I can do. Like, and they complement each other like you know like when I was acting and DJing like they're not that far removed it's not fucking you know it's still in the creative field a little bit and you know obviously I like music and blah 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 so um but yeah it's yeah it's just fucking going for it like I am the art handler I'm the accountant I'm the fucking everything. So, like, if shit fails, it's all on me. But I'd rather that than depend on a business person to try to help guide me and perhaps make suggestions and then maybe want to curate a show and then, like, this, this. Mm-hmm. It's like I don't trust people with money. Yeah, they slowly start fucking putting their foot in before you know it. So, like, I just take it upon myself to do it. And you know what's crazy? I think I'm, like, extremely lazy. 
and like I feel like I'm extremely like uh, like uh, like I procrastinate and I don't deal with shit but somehow I'm able to maintain all this stuff you know yeah. so it's 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 hard you know and I have a kid so there's that so would Home Alone not make money like for example no we we didn't want to make money that would that wasn't the point the okay. point was to show shit we liked would you pay would you pay the artists who are show there do they have to pay you like how does this how does it no work? no no generally it's like friends or you know now with social media like everybody's your friend so you just reach out and you're like hey i like your shit um you know you go to a bar you meet an artist you'd be like hey i want to come over to your studio look at your stuff and then you're like hey you want to do an art show boom like that like <clears throat> even with this current like uh public access thing i'm doing so in July, I got out of St. Mark's. I was like, all right, I'm gonna fucking take some time off, kick it with my kid, go upstate, whatever. August 1st, I signed a lease on this new place. I didn't even know I had credit to sign a lease. I've never been on a lease. But I walked around Chinatown. A lot of my friends have galleries down there. And I found this space, and it used to be the Have a Good Time store, Long oh, Toast store. Sick. So it's pretty built out already. And I was like, I think I can make this work. And they wanted my rent to be a certain amount. And I said, I'll give you this amount. And they were like, okay, let's run your credit. I said, good luck with that. I don't know what my credit is. But I think it was the timing of it and the fact that I didn't like argue too much with the landlords. And they, they, they like art galleries down there. Because art galleries are pretty quiet and they just fucking do their thing. And um, so weirdly, the landlord, he said, the only thing is nothing illegal. I said, what do you, what do you mean by illegal? He goes, you know, gambling. I was like, oh, sure. That's, that's easy, you know. And I haven't heard from him since. And that's fucking great. You know, I love it. He, he doesn't care what I do. And there's an elementary school across the street, so I'm mindful of that. But mm -hmm. other than that, I could be gambling in there. He wouldn't know. You know, it's like, you could do whatever the fuck you want. It's just, like, basically, you have to have the balls to fail. That's, like, my whole thing. And, like, when I opened, after leaving the fucking blue chip gallery, I thought to myself, how much can I afford to lose financially? Like, I have this much saved. And if I lose all of it, will it be a be worth it and I was like yeah like you know some people buy cars or go on vacations a, having a gallery and staying busy is what keeps me sane mm -hmm. you know it's exhausting myself and like and that and we have broken even like we didn't lose all our money you know so that's cool but for me it's more important that the artist who put the time in to give me a show gets paid you know, it's like that. I understand these people are taking time away from their family or whatever to kind of create this work to show in my gallery. So, so I'll try to sell the art for the, for them, and of course I get a cut. But it's a bad feeling when nothing sells, and you have to tell the artist like nothing sold. That sucks. You know. Would you Would you ever get stressed about money when uh, when you would be doing these things, especially when like. You're like, oh, if I if I sold all of that, I mean, if I spent all of my savings or what I have for this, would it be worth it? Would it not? Like, doing these calculations, would it stress you out? No, I don't. Dude, I, like, fucking never look at my bank account. Like, I don't even want to know. Um, but again, I know that I'm not in debt, and that's important. And if the money all goes away, I'll get more next month. Like, you know, I've always just, like been figuring it out there was i don't know when the fuck the last time my mom gave me money like when i was 16 or some shit like i've never gotten handouts from anybody i always just hustle and uh and you you know what's really important for young artists to do is trade with their friends trade art with their friends right because some of my friends have become successful artists and i own their art and so that is the backup plan that's the emergency plan. If there ever comes a day where I have to sell a painting, which I've never sold a painting in my life, of my own collection, that can get me out of danger. 
you know, I didn't know that my friend's painting was going to be worth money later on. He just gave it to me because we were boys, you know. So it's it's good for kids to trade art because there is nothing financial to begin with because you're just trading. Um, but maybe one of you gets lucky and gets a good artwork, you know. So, yeah, I never think about art. I mean, I never think about money. I mean, I do, like, at the first of the month, I'm like, damn, like, that was a lot of money. Like, paying rent on my house, paying rent on the gallery. Figure, like, again, I'm bad at business. So I have to do all the accounting for the gallery. Like, all right, I got this much money. I got to give it to the artist and, like, whatever. And so... Like, somebody wanted to buy some shit the other day. And they're like, don't you got Apple Pay or something? Or I was like, I got Venmo. Like, that's about it, you know? And, like, digital currency? Pff, I don't know anything about that. Like, there are kids that are miles ahead of me when it comes to this, like, marketing, branding. Like, I think of, like, Jerry Sue and his hat company. I'm like, this motherfucker is making way more money than me making hats because he's got somebody that's like smart on the business side of it so I do think about I do think like I should get better at this but I kind of like don't even really have the time like yeah I, I remember and there's this one interview you had where you talked about how in terms of money the way you think about it it's just like if you have enough to eat a place to sleep food and like uh just the ability to dictate what it is you're doing with your time to a certain degree, then you're good. You don't have to like, necessarily be rich. Yeah, I don't think it's about being content with what you have and finding freedom in the idea of like not competing with people. It's like, I don't need that, what that person has, you know, um, I, yeah, I, I've never really, we all need money to survive and this and that, but like, yeah, I, I'm not really into like material shit. Like, I think I would be a really terrible thief, even if I tried, but like, I never need something so bad that I need to go steal it. I'll just live without that thing, yeah. you know. My one addiction probably the main one is like records like if i go in a record shop i'm fucked because i'm dropping a hundred dollars easy that's like like i'll be on a corner being like don't go down the street man like you know there's a record shop on the street like don't go down the street because i know i'm going to spend some money what is it about the records i just fucking love records man i love record shops i love the feeling i love to me it like replaced the skateboard shop you know, a skateboard shop's a hangout more than anything. Record shop, you get to know the employees. You know, you, there's new shit all the time. You'll never hear every kind of music. There's always something new to discover. And, or maybe you fill some gaps that you think you might have. And it's just endless, you know. And so, so that's my shit. Yeah. Um, and again, it's just like, uh, just being careful. Like, I'm, I'm weirdly cheap. Like, yeah, I don't know. Like, I feel bad if I spend like forty dollars a day or something. I'm like, I'm like the type of dude who gets like pizza every day, because I'm just trying to sustain. Like, I don't give a shit about fancy restaurants or anything. Mm -hmm. But then I'll spend money on some bullshit and be like, why did I do that? You know, I don't know. It's, it's I have a weird relationship with it, and I always have. Yeah, I know so. what you mean with the. Uh like not looking at your bank account too often because uh there's like that movie and book uh, into the wild where the, the kid goes um like money makes you cautious you know what i mean and in the and then the in the movie he like burns all his money before he sets out to alaska like before he was like he's just so unsure of the future but he still does it because yeah. he just wants to be completely free from like society in a way yeah. and uh it reminds me of like um this new thing called cryptocurrency and all that stuff coming out um i tried it out for like a month or two and 
I deleted it right away. I took all my money out because I couldn't stop paying attention to it. I was like, oh, it's up today. It's down today. And yeah. it was messing with like my emotions pretty much because I was just so worried about the future and where my money was jumping around. So I just deleted that stuff and like don't want anything to do with that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's also like NFTs. It's like very interesting to hear young kids. They're like basically trying to be like power brokers and like, oh, did you get this new Ethereum coin or some shit? I mean, I sound like a toy even talking about because, but I actually know an investment dude. And uh, when Bitcoin first came out, he's like, give me 10 grand. And I was like, really? nah, I like to see my money. <laughs> like, I was yeah. like, what the fuck, Bitcoin? I'm not, I would be so no, rich if I so listened rich to that right dude's now. advice. Yeah, yeah. And he got rich off it. No, and, people profit so much off this right now. It's and, insane. Uh, so there's things like that where you like maybe like kick yourself a little bit, but you also don't yeah. stress it. You're like, well, fucking yeah. that, that didn't dictate me in any way, shape, or form. So, you know, there's also people who get Bitcoin and then lose their password. Mm -hmm. So like that must suck. You're like, fuck, I got a yeah. million dollars, but and I also don't the, know the password. The way I seen it was like, I felt like I was chasing my own tail. And I know a lot of people I work with too, they, they become like millionaires on, on Bitcoin, like regular union plumbers just becoming, having million dollars in their in their Coinbase account. Like it's insane. You can transfer that to, to, it's real money. to real money. Yeah, it's real money. I mean, you get like tax for using the app and all that stuff, but it's real money. They have it. But what I notice in those people, it's like, I'm like, when is it enough? When are you going to take out yeah. that money? They're like, no, no, I need to let it sit. Like, I'm like, take out some. They're like, no, no, I need to like, if I leave it, it's going to grow and grow and grow. And it's like, yo, what if you die tomorrow? Let's say. Like, yeah. What, what are you going to do think, with all that See, money? I would be comfortable cashing out on something. Yeah. Like, you know, I'm not a good, I've never been a good gambler because the feeling of losing outweighs the feeling <laughs> of winning. Mm. I'd rather keep my ten dollars than make a hundred. That kind of thing, you know. I don't like a, a gamble, and so if I had made twenty grand off Bitcoin, I would just pull that shit out. I'd be like, that was cool for me, like it's, you know. It's, it's, um, but but yeah, it's also like comes back, like basically the I grew up with no money. Like you know, we were like middle class as hell, five kids. Mom mom was like a maid and a telephone operator. My dad was a janitor. So like, basically, everybody's pretty wild. You just had to kind of like look out for yourself. And then I found skateboarding. And then that was it. You know, nobody wanted to be home anyway. That shit sucked. So you just went and skated. And you didn't need money to do it. You needed money to buy boards, that kind of thing. But it was completely free and something you could do by yourself. So that's why so many misfits went to skateboarding. It just made sense. It's like either you do it by yourself or you're with a bunch of other fucking misfits and they could be rich kids or poor kids or whatever, but you generally knew they came from some kind of fucked up family, you know? Uh, so that was kind of, those are like my fondest memories. It's like, sitting in some random bus stop skating with a bunch of people of no money you know and it's like that shit that shit was all free you know um the, uh, and then weirdly skateboarding gets you into things for free yeah like it was so like at the in the beginning of the 90s and stuff like raves were happening and the tunnel club and nasa and that kind of a thing skateboarders were such outcasts that they were kind of cool like People would be like, what? You skate? Like, who does that anymore? Like, you know. And so skateboarding and raving kind of aligned. And you could skip the line if you had a skateboard. Like, people thought it was cool. And uh, and that kind of weird shit. So, yeah. I don't know. But it was never, like, never, like, money-driven, you know. Like, also skateboarding, as a culture back then, the pros maybe made $300 a month. You know, they didn't make real money. Yeah. They they all needed side jobs, you know. And they're a pro skateboarder, but like, you know, what did that mean back then? The companies were small, the paychecks were small. You know, if you watch like a skateboard demo from the early nineties, that shit is it's like like Tony Hawk skating like the worst fucking obstacles trying to get his three hundred dollars for the day, you know, like it's crazy how how big the sport has grown and like how there's actually money to be made now. And that it's like more popular than baseball. Like 
I still prefer the days where it was like the Misfits. Is it really more, it's more popular than baseball now? I think there's like some survey where there's more skate parks being built than baseball diamonds. Mm. Mm. And because uh, again, it like appeals to everybody. And now it's an Olympic sport and like who knows what the fuck's up with that. But um, so I'm sure you're going to have your version of like the soccer mom, but like the skateboard dad who like kicks his son into a vert ramp or whatever. But but like when I like I hang out at Tompkins, like my kids being raised in Tompkins Square, you know, and uh, so I'll go and look at TF and say what's up to whoever I know over there. And I see kids that are not very good, probably will never be any good. And they're still out there every day skating. And I'm like, that's so sick. Like, this guy's never gonna be Eric Costin. He's never gonna be Nigel Houston, but he doesn't give a fuck. And that's kind of what I mean about like, not being afraid of failure. It's not, the, the failure is not what I'm talking about. It's the levels, of success like what is your definition of a level of success is it being a pro skater or is it just enjoying it at the moment you know like to me those kids that don't even care about being pro skaters and they're still out there every day those kids are the sickest because the kids who train like athletes and shit i'm like that doesn't look fun that kid who can barely ollie up this little obstacle and you know and he's still doing it and like capturing his friends on his phone and shit like i'm like that kid's sick you know you can tell the real weirdos and that's what I like. That's it's it's really wild how much uh, skating opens up the world for you, opens up like in, in in many in many aspects, and it's it's cool to see too because, like uh, you're talking about how you had dropped out of high school to just go skating, mm -hmm. and through the education essentially that you that you that you earned through just skating and the shit that would happen while skating, mad shit opened up for you just naturally organically like. Um, I think about your involvement in the movie Kids and how, like, you, you found at Washington Square Park skating, screaming fuck or whatever. And it's like, that's essentially a stroke of luck that uh, oh, yeah. could change, that literally can change an entire life. Yeah. And, uh, like, let's say that you had, like, you might have been in school at that time. Let's say it was fucking 12 o'clock. Like, you could have been in school or, like, and instead you dropped out and you ended up in a super significant film. Yeah. And, I mean, like, fuck, I, I'm poor mom like I don't know what the hell she was going through you know because around this time it's like when rave culture was happening right so my mom was a telephone operator at a hospital and she worked the midnight shift and dad was already gone so mom would pretty much sleep during the day and then go to work at night and uh I forget what her shift was but um basically I could do whatever I wanted during the the day and then I'd come into the city at night and go to clubs. Like, NASA was probably the main one. And then I would try to get back to Jersey for, like, breakfast with my mom. But I'd be on, like, five hits of acid and shit. And, like, so that was sort of, I don't know if it was the beginning, but basically when the, so in the, the way that I ended up in kids, is it's kind of a, a little bit more of a story than people know. So when they were trying to get the money for the movie, and I knew Harmony a little bit. Harmony was kind of a skater. Larry, everybody was like a little like, uh, but eventually Larry became like my father. So, um, so I have a lot to speak on that as well. But so when they were trying to get the money for kids, uh, Larry and Harmony actually did a photo shoot for like the face or something using some of the people in the movie, trying to get sort of a feel through photography of what the movie was gonna be. And there's a kid in that photo shoot that was supposed to play Telly, but he got too old in the two years it took them to get the money. So he basically hit, like hit puberty or something, you know? And then Kim Cardona, the skateboarder who I was friends with from New Jersey, was supposed to play Telly. And his mom knew who Larry Clark was and was like, hell no. <laughs> like, <laughs> my son ain't going to be in your movie. And then somehow I got involved and nobody liked that decision. Only Harmony and Larry. Like, the producers, like, can't even understand what he says. Like, they want to send me to <laughs> speech therapy. And uh, my favorite quote of Larry's 
somebody was like, yeah, but he's not good looking. And Larry said, well, a good, a good looking guy wouldn't need to chase pussy, <laughs> which is kind of true. Like they needed kind of an awkward guy who would like have, this was like his thing was he'd go out and try to find girls, you know, mm -hmm. it wasn't like girls were coming to him. Um, and then, cause I was 60, was I, si no, I was 16 when I made it. I don't even know. I was 60, I was under 18. And so Larry had to meet with my mom. And uh, my mom was pretty hip to it. Like she knew that it was all real. You know, outside of the sex shit, some people might be having sex, but I wasn't having sex back then. Um, the fighting, the hanging out all day, the drinking. My mom, being a mom, knew that that was what's up. And so, and she really liked Larry. And so that's how I kind of ended up doing it. Um, but, but yeah, so, and then, yeah, I'm trying to, fuck, I can't remember, I guess we made in 93, came out in 95, um, but now I'm a 17 year old kid, and again, there's lots of insecurities, I'll always be from New Jersey, that feeling will never leave me, like, I like being the underdog, I like being the outcast, but now representing New York City in this movie and getting a lot of hate from it is kind of fucked up. And again, I'm 17, like I don't know what to do with this and people don't know if it's real or a movie. And the distribution company Miramax, or it was called something else because it was like, I don't know, an unrated or rated X or some shit. But they didn't let any of the actors do any of the promotion because they wanted to keep the lines blurred. Mm. They didn't want people to think these people are just actors, you know. And Justin Pierce very much like his part, Harold Hunter very much like his part, Rosario very much like her part. The only two people where it was like a stretch is like me and Chloe because Chloe was a last minute decision. She wasn't supposed to play that part. They had an actress that was supposed to play that part. And the, and me being a skater from New Jersey, it was like hard enough to hang out with those dudes. Harold was always cool, but everybody else was dicks. And they would remind you you're from Jersey every second they got. <laughs> and you would just, and but like Bobby Puglio's from New Jersey. We had good fucking skaters from yeah. Jersey, but we were still whack. And so, um, so yeah, it was like, it was, it was weird to do the film and then be recognizable for somebody who was pretty insecure and like, I just skated by myself. I didn't really care about other people. And uh, so I went back and I worked at the skate shop in Jersey for like, I don't know, a couple months. And now I would get like threatening phone calls. Like people knew I worked there and they'd be like, fuck, kill you and shit. Like, all right, dude, whatever. Like, and so I ended up saving money and I moved to London because I knew the movie wouldn't come out in London for like a year. And it, I don't know if it was an intentional thing, but basically, and again, like, I don't know anybody there. I just go and I get a youth hostel and I'm staying in a youth hostel with some dude sleeping above me. I'm like hiding my passport and shit. And... The cool thing about skateboarding is I go to Slam City Skates, which is in Covent Garden, because that's like, I've seen their ad in Thrasher and shit. And I meet this kid, Seth Curtis, who would become my roommate for the next year. Like that night we went out skating and lots of Japanese kids live in, in um, London for university and stuff. So I was being introduced to all these new kids. And again, I don't know how I survived. I just you went there at seventeen. I was eighteen. So sixteen years old as kids, seventeen, and then eighteen, you go to London. Yeah. So I think kids probably came out when I was seventeen, and I was like, "Fuck this, I'm out." And then ended up in London for a year, which was sick. Like I love London. That shit was fun because now you're going to drum and bass parties, fucking hanging out with Tom Penny at South Bank. It's like I got like I fell in love with Stella beer like 
over there they call it wife beater and like because that was like 99p it was like the cheap beer it was like mm-hmm. our Budweiser and um so and again it's just being on your own and just like exploring and with the skateboard you have the ability to do that you can go anywhere um and then I mean I was broke like when you only like only going to grocery store style broke like you know you don't eat out at all you go to a grocery store you get beans on toast whatever you can afford a beer at night whatever so after a year of that I came back but again I was like fuck New York just feels weird you know and the idea of going becoming an actor never occurred to me nobody said hey you should do this why don't you take this opportunity and be an actor there was nobody there to guide us after the film so most people got their five grand which is what we got paid fucking spent it for a few months and then they were back to where they began before the film you know which is like kind of fucked up like somebody should have stepped in and been like hey these these are opportunities and uh so I came back from London. Again, New York felt weird. So I went to LA. And like, I didn't go to LA to, to act. I went to LA to skateboard. Because I was weirdly friends with Steve Barra. And so I go to LA. And now I'm sleeping under Steve Barra and Eric Costin's fucking dining room table. Where Sean Sheffy had been sleeping before me, I think. And I'm an assistant to Damon Wayans. Like, do you know who Damon Wayans is? He was an actor on, like, in Living Color. And um, he's, like, a big comedic actor from the 90s. But, like, I'm his assistant. And uh, just doing dumbass shit. Like, going to Pier 1 Imports to, like, furnish his house. Waiting for the cable dude. Like, but that's what I got to do to make money, you know? And, uh... One day, he's working on this TV show, and one day somebody, like, I have to drive another actor to set. And they're like, aren't you the dude from Kids? Like, what are you doing? And I was like, yeah, I don't know. Like, I'm just doing what I need to do to make money. Like, I don't don't really think about it. Um, And so maybe that, like, I think, maybe I tried to, like, kind of figure out how to be an actor after that a little bit but still couldn't but I meet a girl and then we end up moving back to New York when I guess I was like 21 or something and this is where like friendships were really like formed like my art world friendships like all the skating shit was still kind of there but this was like where Dash Snow and everybody kind of enter the picture you know all like the weirdos and um, so, yeah, so that was like kind of the, the next step in me being in New York. Like, this is my new identity. Like, I'm no longer the guy from that movie. I'm now this thing. I'll never shake being the guy from that movie. But it didn't define me necessarily. You Do know? you not like the fact that you were in that movie? No, I have no problem with it. But um, I don't really give a shit about acting. That's the problem. Mm. Like, it's it's cool, and I'm glad I d- did it. But it's not... Like, I don't know if my kid knows I'm an actor. Like, he's never seen me be an actor. Like, I never talk about it. So, But for me, it's just, like, moving forward. All right, like, that was a thing that happened. What's happening tomorrow? That kind of a thing. You know, it's like... That movie has a lot of history, and I understand it's important to a lot of people, but... Maybe, like, I'm fucking traumatized by it somehow, and I just don't think about it. And like I said, like, me and Larry are still very close. I talked to Harmony the other day. I still see Chloe all the time. And we did go through something together, you know. Um, We'll always be friends because of it. Uh, Larry did grow into a sort of, like, father figure for me. But it was nice when I did The Wire because I became known for something else. Mm. it wasn't just like oh you're the dude from the kids it's like oh you're the dude from the wire I'm like thank god like because that kid shit was getting old and it, I think it like kind of validated that I could do 
different things that I was kind of an actor of some skill, but, but like, I've never seen the wire. Like, I'm not really interested in that. I enjoy some of the process of working, like, you know, like getting to know people and like acting and like, but again, it's weird to luck into something like, that. you know, I always feel bad for not being more grateful because I know there are people who want to act their entire lives and maybe not ever get that chance. You know, like I wish I was more thankful than I am. But so did you leave, did you, when you left New York to go to London, you leave strictly because of the feeling like, yo, everybody knows who I am, but this, this as this, uh, or everybody knows my face and thinks they know who I am because of this movie part, that was why you left? Yeah, pretty much. It was like, yeah, it wasn't a good thing to be known for. Like, that's the thing. Like, Harold's Harold. Like, he's funny. He's, like, crazy. Like, everybody loves Harold. I was, like, the bad guy, you know. And so, yeah, again, there was, like, nobody to kind of hold my hand or guide me. It was, like, me sitting in Union Square at night by myself or, like, Astor Place. And people would be like, oh, you're that dude. Like, fuck. And I don't like being, like, recognized. And it's like, especially for being like a bad guy that nobody knows if it's real or fake, you know. After that movie, did the, did the, the, the New York kids, like the skaters and shit that used to clown you for being from Jersey, did they grow more like accepting of you? Did Hell you become... no. It was even worse. Like they were like, you know, I wasn't in that movie kids because I ain't no kid. <laughs> like shit <laughs> like that. Like, dude, they were fucking dicks, like so salty. And it's, they're still salty. Like... They're still talking about it. Really? And, yeah. And it's like, I'm not even, like, talking shit about it. They're the ones bringing it up to me. And I'm like, dude, like, you need to let that shit go. Because a lot of people feel like Larry manipulated the scene or didn't... I don't know what the word is. But there are people that felt like they were cultivating that scene and that Larry kind of, like, took it from them, you know? Um, cause they were probably like participants in that scene, you know, and Larry's this 50 year old guy who could figure out ways to get money to make a movie. Um, but the one smart thing Larry did was he got 19 year old Harmony Corinne to write it. And so Harmony was of that world. He was a skater. He just happened to be really smart and had the kind of discipline to lock himself in a room for two or three weeks and write that movie, you know? So like... If Larry wrote that movie, it wouldn't be anywhere near as good. Like, he needed a 19-year-old's perspective of, like, what was real, you know. Um, but, yeah, like, again, like, I've always just kind of been, like, an outsider. And, like, mm, that's why, like, when, like, the whole Ryan McGinley thing happened, that was, like, a real meshing of a couple different worlds. Um, and that's when people really found like their real friends that they would get older with and stuff. Um, so, so why'd you decide to move back to New York? Uh, I was dating this girl, Hillary at the time. And I think it was just like New York schooler. I don't know. Like there's New York's an addiction, you know, it's like as much as you hate it, you always just fucking come back. And, it's just cooler here than anywhere else. You know, like the people are cooler, the style's cooler, even the fucking terrible weather is cooler. It's like more of a struggle, which makes it cooler. Like, I don't know. It's just the energy of being in New York. Like, and not to talk shit about anywhere else, but it just seems to me, this is where I belong. Like, the, like I don't know. Like, I like the struggle. Like the, anything can happen on any day. You know, I'm pretty productive when it comes to like art world shit. Like in New York, I can see like 30 art shows in a week. In LA, dude, it's hard because things are spread so far out and Ubers are expensive and everything. So, you know, I skate everywhere. I mean, if I don't have to take the train and like, I just see mad shit and I like that, you know? Um, so, but yeah, I don't know. 
But have I you, like Berlin. Berlin's sick. Have you ever felt any impediments to your artistic process, trying to make, trying to make galleries happen, trying to make shows happen, because of the high rent, or because of the soaring prices? Yeah. I mean, without COVID, I couldn't have done it. Like, COVID fucking put some of those prices on their ass. And, like, you add a little bit more standing with negotiation because you're like, dude, there's been a for rent sign on that thing for fucking two years. What are you doing? Like, do you see how many other places have for rent signs on them? Like, who else is, who's going to rent this? And the other thing with an art gallery is landlords know that art galleries generally clean the place up, you know? They keep it pretty nice, white walls, nice floor, and and it's an, kind of a nice way for them to showcase what they, what they have in two years when you leave or however long, you know? So landlords are pretty open to art galleries. They know things don't get too messy. Um, but, you know, again, I know what I can afford, which isn't very much, and and uh, so, yeah, like if the landlord said he didn't want to take my deal, then I wouldn't have a gallery. I was like, that's what I got, man, you know. Um, the other thing I learned with uh, like when I worked in Chelsea, because basically I had like a small art gallery in a larger art gallery. Like I curated all the shows. I like put whatever I wanted in there. And they got like a lot of street cred for it. That was like the, the payoff for them. You know, we'd sell stuff from time to time, but it was more about the audience. And I was like, fuck, what if other major galleries took this idea of like basically sponsoring a smaller gallery and paying the rent maybe for some staff or, you know, things like insurance. Not only would you build your roster of artists, but you'd also build the kind of, people who would work for your gallery you know you'd build art handlers you would build receptionists you it would it would cost them nothing they spend so much money on these bullshit dinners that would cover a month's rent for a small gallery you know there is a way to do it but like this could be an art gallery you know like i grew up curating at pizzerias and fucking bars like wherever like max fish is a super important bar to the new york art world because they would let whoever wanted, for the most part, curate a show if they had time. And you would invite all your friends, and you'd be like, you know what, guys? More people will probably see your art in this bar than if it was up in Chelsea, you know? Um, and it's those places where you learn and experiment. And even when I have young kids, like last year Adam Zoo did a, a show in my space. Mm -hmm. He curated a show. And I told him, you know, it's what's important is the community. Don't worry about the art. Like, don't, you guys get too fancy with your art shit. Like, just put good people in the show. And don't worry about, like, the quality of the art. That's all, like, fucking art world bullshit, you know. And so, so like, you know, like, even with the gallery now, between every, like, say, four or five week show, I'll have a one week window for somebody to do something, you know? And these are for the kids that are generally looking to rent a pop-up. And I'm like, look, you don't need to rent a pop-up. I need your audience as much as you need a space for free. So let's work together. And, and it's cool, you know? And then if you do that long enough, then the bigger companies say like, fuck, I want some of that. How about I throw 10 grand your way? You know, that sort of idea of putting in the work and then you'll get paid off later. So, but again, like, this could all backfire, and nobody ever wants to fucking rent my space, but it's not a big deal. In your opinion, like, um, uh, do you notice, like, the youth being more into, like, creative endeav endeavors now, like, like doing pop-ups and art, stuff like that, than back in the days, or what's the ratio? Like, how was it? I think they're probably better at marketing themselves now, like... Obviously, like, clothing is, like, a huge thing for kids and, like, and kind of identity, you know, like, who they are as an identity. And art is just maybe one thing. You know, maybe they're music producer, artist, and they dress crazy or something. So, and I think a lot of that probably has to do with Instagram and 
maybe a little bit of showing off. Like we didn't have Instagram, so there was a freedom to that, you know. Like we weren't experimenting in front of everybody live all the time. We had the freedom to fuck up and you know, not everything was being recorded. Um so yeah, I th- I don't know, but like For me, I think like kids are good at promoting themselves, but I'm not sure if it's for the right reasons. And uh, I'm, I have a complicated relationship to it. I think there's a lot of arrogance there. Like I'm dope kind of shit. There meaning on Instagram? Yeah, or just in general, like I'm the shit. Like I'm so dope. And you're like, so? Like who cares? Like I don't know. Like. You're not that dope to me. Um, there's like I I hate arrogance. I hate people that think they're like cool and shit. And like the, the coolest people I know are the biggest fucking nerds in the world and like just awkward weirdos. And I'm like that dude's cool. Like he's not fronting. Like he's a real weirdo. Um, so <laughs> it's like you know I worry about raising a kid in New York City. Yeah. Because I came from Jersey, so I always had to fight for whatever respect I got. Whereas him growing up in Tompkins, hey, I fucking grew up in Tompkins Square Park. Like, I'm a cool kid. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm like, if you're at the TF, you better have a fucking skateboard in your hand. Like, you're not just chilling, dude. Like, you know, like, it's, uh, I don't know. It's, It's complicated because, like, for me, Instagram is interesting because it's like good self promotion but the feedback can be very misleading cuz nobody really leaves negative comments so if you get 500 likes on this painting you probably think you're pretty dope it should be in an art show but if i said hey this painting kind of isn't that great now i'm the hater so like so it's very it's also you know what's weird is like Thinking about like labels, like, I don't know, it's like millennials and Gen Z and fucking boomers. And I don't know. Back in the day, there was just old people and young people. (laughs) Now it's almost like by decade, people are calling out each other. And it's become very sensitive, the whole thing. Like when I was growing up, you paid your dues. You got talk shit to like. You know, you like you just were straight up disrespected by older dudes. And that was like part of it. No kids can take that anymore. Like I'll tell kids the honest truth, how I feel. Other thing like cancel culture. Like, dude, when you went out back in the day, if like some weird dude didn't grab your dick, that was like a bummer of a night. You're like, what? <laughs> like nothing even happened. Like you just went home and like now that dude would get like canceled and all this weird shit would happen. And it's like, dude, you guys are just maybe being a little too sensitive, you know? I mean, but again, we were, there was, it's called post nine 11. There was something to that spirit of fuck the world. Like we don't give a shit anyway. Like Julian, like the whole fucking thing. We just hated it all. And so we were going to live fast, die young. And then you don't die and you're kind of like, fuck. But um, (laughs) so it's like, you know, like, and a lot of people ask me about different points in my life and stuff. I'm like, you know, the only thing I did right was stay alive. Like the reason I have these stories to tell is because I just didn't die. And I stuck around for a long time. And like, if you stick around for a long time, you're going to have a lot of stories too. So just don't fuck up and die. You know, like that's pretty much the end of it, you know. It's really crazy. Um, getting back to like the Instagram thing, uh, in terms of art, how I think just Instagram just numbs you to art, numbs you to talent, numbs you to beauty. Because um, even if you appreciate it, you don't as much like back, back, even, even when I was uh, younger than I already am, when I'd show up to skate parks, show up to street spots, and I'd see someone do a trick, I'd be like, yo, like, like that was the shit and then now i don't like it really almost doesn't matter what they do because i've seen so much insanity on instagram through like just skating 
yeah. that I'm like, yo, this does not impress me. But same thing in terms of graffiti. Same things. I almost always see it first online, and then, and then it's no longer impressive in person. But on the flip side, in terms of art, it gives you ability to reach people that you would have never been able to reach without the help of like, let's say, like a, a Larry Clark. Like, yeah. you could never reach that many people. But now. If you know how to manipulate uh, this fucking application that legit everybody has on their phone, so it's like people probably check Instagram more than they check the New York Times, dude. Like, oh, for I, sure. especially like uh, p- people within our demographic. So it's like if I can post, it's like me posting something to the New York Times. If more, you know what I mean. It really depends on like the following that I'm able to grow. So it has like its ups and downs. But in terms of like the the like the cancel culture and shit, like yeah, like for example, if someone were to film, let's say kids. Now, they, they like Larry Clark would probably get his ass canceled. You know what I mean? Like I mean, dude, there's a lot of artists out there that could be canceled so many times, but I think people have given up. They're just like, yeah, this dude's just crazy, or yeah, yeah. like, or they, the artists, don't give a fuck. They're like, mm. cancel me? I don't give a fuck. Like, mm. what does that do? Like, um. <laughs> So, like, Larry's not sensitive to it, is what I'm saying. Like, he doesn't care if people are like, oh, that dude's a creep. He's like, so, <laughs> like, fuck you. But but he cares if people think he's taking advantage of younger people. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, it's, so it's like, it's, it's not that he's not affected by it, but it's like, what are, your, what are you implying is kind of what would get him offended, you mm-hmm. know? Um, but, uh... But yeah, and it, it's also weird. Um, what was I gonna say about the, the Instagram thing? Oh no, let's switch subjects. Or yeah, something. Um, yeah, no, no. Just like in terms of the Instagram thing, I wanted to know if you think that Instagram is good or bad long term for art and culture. Uh, it's like kind of a loaded question. Like, so the way I approach Instagram is like. A, I have a gallery that I need to promote, right? But I want to promote other galleries through my gallery. So as long as 90% of the content I'm putting out is promoting other things, it's okay to promote myself every 10%. Like, you know, every 20th post can be of my kid. It doesn't have to be every post. But if I slide it in there every now and again, that's okay. So I think if you're using your Instagram to promote other things other than yourself, that's pretty cool, you know? Um, so that's how I approach it. The other thing is, I don't know, like say, I think you can take a lot of missteps, right? Because everybody's looking at the same shit. Everybody's fishing out of the same pond. So as a young artist, you're just looking to get put on, you know, and Maybe you, you'll work with this streetwear company, but now you've done that, so no other streetwear companies will fuck with you. You know, it's, it's sort of maybe you, I don't know, like you don't have enough time to mature to make the right decisions because you're so hungry to be put on, you know? And like I think about like the whole streetwear thing and how like Huff and Supreme and, and I don't even know fucking who, they must all be looking at these same artists trying to think of like think the same thing like how can we use this artist as a graphic designer or this or that you know mm-hmm. and it's tricky because like me physically I go to art galleries like I go to record stores I have to physically see these things because looking on Instagram doesn't do much for me and then the other thing I think about Instagram is like I met my wife at a bar I went up and like started talking and shit. Now you go to a bar. If somebody's not with somebody else, they're just looking at Instagram. And you're like, what happened to these like random encounters? Like what happened to these like, yo, let's meet up at the spot and then we're just gonna hit the streets. It's like, you know, I'm friends with photographers. The second they're not filming or shooting something, everybody's just on their phone. Like everybody's just disconnected. There's no more small talk. There's no more like random things happening. And I think that's kind of crazy. Like, 
you know, like not being open to the world. You're mm -hmm. like just zeroed in on your phone. It's, it's definitely hard to find a balance, right? Because you can use Instagram to meet people in real life, real life that you, yeah. wouldn't have, or you wouldn't have met without, let's say, Instagram. But at the same time, like then when you are out in these experiences and you're just fucking living through the phone, it, it is crazy. And it's like the phone's like a robot. It's, it's like an AI that follows us, you know, indirectly. Like it is never more than five feet away from me. Yeah. And I'm just checking it consistently for, God forbid, I miss something important, which like how important is it going to be? And like I could just see it later. Or, you know yeah. what I mean? It's, it's like really crazy how, how like significant Instagram is in our modern day lives. And I think it's really noticeable. I, I don't really go to too many um, music shows anymore. But when you see like photography of a music show, like from the back of the performer and it's all just phones, the whole audience is just phones, like where it used to be lighters or some yeah. shit, but now mm -hmm. it's just like the flash from a phone. And you're like, these people are not in the moment, obviously. And maybe they're just filming it to prove to other people, like, look where I was. I was at fucking Nicki Minaj or I don't even know who's popular, but it's like, you're just trying to capture this moment to brag almost or mm. something instead of just sitting there and be like, yo, this is pretty dope. Like, I don't know. It's because yeah, those little moments add up. And by the, when you're on your deathbed, you're like, yo, I didn't, I never lived in the moment. I was just always trying to satisfy someone that I don't even care about at the end of the day. Yeah. Like, and I understand cloud chasing and like fucking look at me or like this or that. And there are some cool things that happen in life. And you're like, yo, I want to tell people about mm -hmm. this shit. But for one chance or another, it doesn't happen. And, and uh, you're like, fuck. But you're like, at least I still got that moment. Like, and back in the day before Instagram, all my friends walked around with like a Yashica T4. That was like the camera everybody used. Yeah. And I would say 90% of us still have our negatives from that time period. And there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of photo like photo documentation of life pre-Instagram. And those are all going to make good books and various other things in the future. When I look at my Instagram or even my iPhone photos, there's so much bullshit on there. Like when you're shooting film, you fucking care. You know, you're like, I, I got like five photos left. I'm going to fucking, you know, see what else happens. There's a different mentality that is shooting digitally and then shooting and They film. lose value when they're digital, at least to me. Like yeah. my digital photos, I'm like, yeah, fuck it. I might never. But then the film ones that I have, even like the scans that I have, I'm like, yo, like, this is like a real moment that was captured. But yeah. realistically, like, they don't, it doesn't have to be that way, which is the crazy part. Like, we, we I guess, abuse <coughs> the digital. You take, take it oh, for yeah, granted. It has no value because it's infinite, yeah. whereas the film is finite. Yeah, so... Yeah, there's a bit of taking it for granted and shooting everything because because you can, you know, like, fuck, I'll shoot this. Like, oh, this carpet is interesting. Let me take a photo of it and show it to my wife. Um, so, so, yeah, it's it's like a necessary evil. I can't imagine, like, the, the real deal of photographers, especially those from the past era that were, you know, it was just all film, you had to have skill, you had to know the lighting, you had to know how to change the settings, you had to know, like, what the fuck you were actually doing, um, as opposed to, like, a phone that does all the work for you, uh, to an extent, in terms of, like, the settings and understanding, like, composition and shit like that, and it's, like, I feel bad, because I'm, like, damn, yo, like, I feel like in that era, it's, like, it was something to have a camera, it was something to be the guy, like, like, who was doing that now, everybody has a camera, Everybody can be well, that guy. Well, it's like, like being a cab driver or being an Uber driver. Yeah, it's done. You know, it's like, yeah, these cabbies are fighting for their livelihood because somebody invented this app where anybody could do their job and their phones have maps on them and there's like no, like, you know, like in London, the black cabs, they all take this thing called like the test or something. And it takes like 10 years to pass this test and you have to know every single road in London. And uh, then one day somebody fucking gets their, you know, um, Uber thing and their iPhone maps and they're, they're doing this guy's job that he like basically went to university for, yeah. you know, and the medallion fucking weird sketchy medallion shit. And so, so yeah, it's like, or I mean, DJing, there's, there's a lot of industries that can be compared, like, you know, this idea of like skill versus like 
No, like uh, most things I think could be taken over by by something else. Like, like um, it's easy to think like, no, it could never happen to this thing. Like how, how we were talking about. But like, if you think about like the taxi, um, like I don't know much about the taxi system, but I know that in New York it was like a huge thing to have a medallion. Like motherfuckers would sell it for bread and shit like that. If I was a taxi driver, I'd be like, no fucking way that something could come and take it over. You know how hard it is to get a medallion? Yeah. Do you know how hard it is? How would we give a medallion to just everyone? But like, no, there's a new system that does not involve a medallion. Yeah. But if, the if you're thing so you spent a hundred thousand dollars on is useless now. Is useless. And, it is useless. And you, you're still paying it off for however long it will take you. And through no fault of your own, somebody reinvented the industry, mm. and you're still caught on the line for that hundred thousand dollars and the thing is is the the common person doesn't even appreciate the history doesn't care they just want to get to where they're going they don't even understand the differences between what happened they just it's just the convenience yeah and i mean i'm definitely not the smartest guy in the room to be talking about these kind of like highly charged things but um and i really don't take cabs or ubers too too much i'm like subway and skateboard guy but um but yeah, it's it's fucked up. I don't know. I don't know. It's really crazy the 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 fucking like life path that you've lived. It seems like it was all just on some like it just happened. Like there was no Yeah. I mean cuz that's kind of true. And it's sort of just being open to shit. It just being like, "All right, let's go down this road. Let's see what this where this takes us." And you know, I've always been, like, weirdly, like, kind of conservative and not, like, too reckless. I mean, I've definitely had some nights, but I think because I kind of, like, raised myself, I always knew there was, like, no one to back me up or bail me out. And so I had to, like, kind of keep it together enough to where I couldn't be a complete maniac. Um, Because, yeah, there was no... There was no backup plan. So that that probably helps a little bit. Like I'm more cautious than I might let on. Mm. Like, you know, I'm not out doing drugs and shit. Like I'm not like pretend flashy, like spending money I don't have, that kind of thing. It's like, no, I know how the I know how this thing works mm. and I have to have a certain level of responsibility to keep that working. And like if I fuck that up. You know, it's like, for me, people who do drugs now, that's crazy. Like, it's life or death, you know? And it's like, I can't afford that chance for one night of fun to possibly end up dead, you know? That, which is crazy, because me and my friends love drugs. Like, our 20s, we did a lot of them. Now I listen to music. And I like like music that makes you feel like you're going to have a fucking panic attack because it replaces that feeling of doing drugs, you know, where you're like, fuck, this shit is crazy. Like, I love that idea of being out of control, but you can only do that for so long, Mm. you know. And especially, like, the way shit's cut now. And I mean, back in the day, you'd just get, like, a shitty sinus infection for two weeks. Now, shit is no game. But, um, so, yeah, it's, it's always just kind of being a little cautious or conservative like i've never drank hard alcohol i've only drank beer and like that's because i might fucking like hard alcohol and now i got a problem you know that sort of a thing um yeah just kind of knowing your boundaries sort of i gotta say uh just immense thank you for coming yeah. on the show yeah i hope um you got something no it's no, it absolutely because <laughs> like amazing. you know again in the, the way that there is no plan there is no explaining it either. It's mm. like there were kind of different chapters and uh, sometimes it's hard to explain it all because there is some fun shit we didn't talk yeah. about. But. No, you're very well spoken, yeah, man. It was very so interesting. Oh, you guys to are hear, pros man. compared to me. Um, but no, thank you. And uh, thank you for having me in the studio. <laughs> I was hoping. Does Bruce Lee change sometimes? Uh, Bruce Lee has been Bruce Lee for like so we've existed for like a year and a few months i guess and like at first we had some other shit but now it's this yeah keep bruce lee he's good yeah, i really like this one very significant moment yeah all right boys yeah, thank, you so much. Yeah, thank, thank you thank you man Peace.